Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 201 for Monday, February 18th, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome. To Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians about to enter our fifth year here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And out here in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kemp. Happy hey, anniversary, Dave. Happy almost anniversary. That's right. If we, I was thinking today is, is President's Day here in the U.S. So if you and I had chosen to take today off from podcasting, then we would have naturally wound up uh, recording this episode on February 19th, which in 2015 was the day we recorded and released the first episode that any of you know about. So there you go. Yeah. Do you remember the conversations leading up to, we should do this, we should do this? Of course. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. we would, we would just talk on the phone just, you know, cause we would see each other in very specific windows of the year. But, you know, once we made this kind of musical connection, in addition to our professional life connection, you know, we would just call each other and, you know, just see how our gigs are going and see what was going on. And then that light bulb came on. This this could be a podcast. This could be. Yeah. No, I, I the idea was yours and I am ever so thankful for it. Yeah, it's fun. I like it. Fun ride. It's really been yeah. great. You know, we hear from people from all over the world who do what we do. You know, we, some things are similar. Some things are vastly different. But it's just, uh, you know, this thing that we do that we try to, you know, is so soul filling and satisfying and, and seems to make other people happy. It's just kind of a cool thing to have these connections. You know, certainly you and me getting to talk this often is great. Yeah. But then hearing from people who are also doing it is kind of cool also. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. A little bit of uh, group therapy going on sometimes. For sure. So, yeah. No, it's good. It's uh, yeah. So there we are uh, wrapping four up years. fourth year, our fourth year and entering our fifth. Yeah, man. If four year is um, pedal boards, I think, is the gift for four year, right? Uh, I think so. Actually, I think you might be ahead of the game on that, right? Didn't you get one of those uh, things for, we talked last week, we were going to mention the stuff we got for Christmas. You got something, right? right. Yeah. yeah. So I got, um, I think we talked about our wish list, and I had that, that outlaw nomad pedal board. So the, it, it's a pedal board that has battery and power built into the pedal board, like literally into the structure of the pedal board. So you don't have to plug the pedal board and you can charge it. And so in places where there's not a lot of power or you want consistent power from your pedal board, it's, you know, looked on the surface like a good deal. I'm still kind of, I'm still kind of getting used to it. So, you know, first thing it shipped and it shipped with universal plugs, right? Okay. And and uh, they didn't work. The, well, at least the U.S. one didn't work. And so, you know, it wouldn't charge was the first one I got. So I called them. And as I called them, you know, they're in Canada. It took a little while to get to get a response. But I called and emailed. Got a response back. Nice response saying, yeah, we, you know, there was a manufacturing problem with our with our power supply. Not our power supplies, the plugs. And, um, the, you know, the, the, the thing you plug into the wall. And... Um, he said, we're just getting a new batch and I'll send you one right out, which he actually did send another one out, which was kind of cool. But now I'm finding, you know, in use um, on any of my overdrive pedals, um, noise is in the system. Right. So really? it's not my tuner. Yeah, it's not my tuner. It's you know not many other things. And I also don't really have a, a, a very um, straightforward answer. I have a couple pedals that have some unique power um, requirements. Um, I have a, a Strymon Lex, which is a um, a Leslie simulator pedal, which I really like. And I have a TC Electronic Triple Play, which is, you know, kind of a big complicated yep. um, uh, delay, you know, amongst other things. But, but um, powering those is a little bit different. And um, it, I haven't found, you know, I haven't gotten any answers yet to, you know, the right way to wire them or if I need a special cord. And, um, so that's a little confusing, but, but even powering those separately, just powering them by themselves as I used to not through the board, which again, defeats the purpose of the board. But, um, the thing that's concerning is I just have a regular old overdrive pedal and that pedal itself, when it's being powered by the internal battery is, is uh, inducing some noise into the system. So huh. like a, that's weird. So. Usually. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, that's but, how, uh, I mean, they seem willing to help. So hopefully I'll get good. them yeah. online or another and we'll see if we'll see if it's a solvable thing. Yeah. Right. Right. Cause it seems like such a cool idea to like have less all wires, the better, man. Yeah, exactly. Right. 
Right. Sort Although of the flip side of that is batteries are not your friend either, because, you know, when you least expect it, a battery will yeah. not be charged as much as you think. And so it's I mean, there's lights on this thing to tell you the capacity of the charge. But um, living, you know, like we know in a, in a laptop and, and, and phone world, you know, having to charge as part of your routine, routine every night is, is, uh, is yeah. a weird thing. It's sort, of a, it's sort of a friend. drag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Batteries are not our friends. It's true. Except that they fuel our entire worlds now. Life, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, cool. It's so odd that consumer batteries haven't really gotten much better in, in what, 40 years? Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for Tesla to really, like, th- th- as far as I see it, Tesla is a battery company, right? Like, mm. that's a thing that well, they, they sell are, a battery. Well, they do. They but they, they sell, sell a battery in a car. That's correct. They built a car around a battery. If you if you right. think of it that way, right? So and like most of their R and D, I don't want to say most, but a good chunk of their R and D goes into batteries. And I'm I'm hoping that they or someone else, you know, will make this breakthrough into a new plateau of 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 battery capacity. But oh, yeah. man, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Batteries and and uh, consumer airline travel don't seem to have dramatically changed in terms of efficiency in a long time. Uh, you know, I have a, a, I mean, people that listen to this show know I'm crazy. So I, I guess it's okay to share my <laughs> idea here, but you know, like the worst part is you're just sitting on the plane and you're uncomfortable and you're like, you know, bored and you're dealing with all the people that you don't want to deal with and like all of that, right? The best thing you could do is get on the plane, fall asleep the moment you get on the plane and wake up the moment that you're 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 landing, right? In my opinion, that's that's yeah. great. Cuz yeah, you okay, so let's say we can't make the plane go any faster, but at least we didn't have to experience the, you know, the the time in the air. So why not replace all of the flight attendants with registered nurses, replace the uh, the seats with lay flat beds and stack people up three high and administer propofol to everybody. As soon as you get on the plane, <laughs> knock them out. And then, you know, you don't have to worry about feeding them. You don't have to worry about bathrooms, you know, none of this stuff. And then when it's time to land, you wake everybody up and, uh, you know, get off the plane. That's the end of that. Uh, you know, the airlines is the, is the one industry I can think of that their strategy is to make their customers as miserable as possible. So they'll buy the next level of service. I mean, it, you know, the, the amount of stuff they've taken away over the years to make travel so unbearable, you know, is just crazy. It's, you know, smaller seats, less, less carry on luggage, you know, obviously the, the, the time it takes to get through an airport and get out of an airport yeah, is terrible. It's a disaster. It's just, yeah. yeah. And you know, it, it seems like that's a, a tactic, obviously not the TSA stuff, but it seems like it's a tactic that, uh, you know, the bare bones ticket now, you know, is you don't get to choose your seat, you know, all no. like no. silly things, right? Silly. <laughs> and, yes. and, you know, again, I think they're just trying to make you miserable. So you'll spend a little bit more money for the next level of service, which it's true. is you know, a service yeah. that they used to give you and really doesn't probably cost them anything. I don't think it costs them anything to have you choose your seat. So, nope, sure doesn't. It's just something Didn't that used to. Well, but here's the thing, as I understand it, and maybe this has changed, but I don't think so. The, if there's a tax, a tax treatment difference for the airlines. They pay one level of taxes on the fare, right? On the base fare. But then again, this is, you know, I didn't dig too deep here, but as I understand it, any uh, additional fees were not taxed or were taxed at a much lower rate. So by simply, even if they say, okay, the price of the flight was a hundred dollars and we're now going to charge you $25 to uh, reserve your seat. Now, instead of paying taxes on a hundred if they reduce the price of the flight by 75 bucks and say, okay, you're going to pay 75 for the flight and 25 for the seat. They're actually, they actually are making more in the end because they're paying less in taxes on that fee related thing versus this fare related thing. I, but the I, net I, net is still customer hostile because it's, it's certainly it's not totally like customer seen, hostile. Yeah. yeah. I mean, good for them if they found a way to make money, but if they're the way that they're making money is by, you know, offering an absolutely miserable experience as a base level experience yeah. in, in an already challenged thing. You know, sitting in one of those in one of those tight cramped seats for five hours is just, you know, it it, it is a miserable experience yeah, to begin it sucks. with. Yeah. yeah. So come right. fly anyway, Propofol we, we Airlines. You know, there you go. Propofol Hamilton <laughs> Airlines. Hamilton I don't know that I need my name right on the plane. I, especially we'll get you with there this and one. you won't even remember. You won't even remember. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>
That's awesome. Uh, so now everybody knows I'm crazy, but I also, uh, for Christmas, got something that was on my wish list, and that was a new pitch slap, uh, which is the uh, Cajon, the brand of Cajon that I use. And, and these guys have figured out a way to put uh, guitar pegs in in their Cajons. I, first of all, they figured out a way to make their Cajons sound fantastic. <laughs> like I've played lots of different brands of Cajons and these guys like really know what they're doing to just give it resonance and tone and easy to play. And so I got um, I got a new one. Uh, Lisa and the kids got me another one for Christmas this year. And I need I've been meaning to email the pitch slap guys to ask like specific details about this model because it is different. It's it's a different size, but I'm I'm pretty sure it's also different woods. Lisa wasn't entirely sure. And, and she knew I'd get a kick out of, you know, chatting with these guys. And so this show will be my reminder of that as I tell people that, you know, oh, yeah, we mentioned your stuff on the show. Hopefully. So, guys, I want to talk. I want to find out. Uh, but I think what she got me was the spank box, which is a little bit smaller and um and it's got a That's bur- branding right there there you go exactly <laughs> yeah see propofol airlines and the spank box i think we've got a title for the show uh it, so it's got a bur- i think it's got a birch snare chamber it sh- certainly feels like birch and they say a walnut um like low low end chamber but um uh, it's it's I, i've played it i haven't brought haven't gigged with it yet but i've played it at a couple of rehearsals and and little jam sessions and stuff and it's fantastic it really it's it's fun different pitch it's a little bit higher pitch a little bit punchier and um and so i'm i'm stoked to have it yeah pretty cool mm, pretty cool. cool yeah yeah all right um I don't know where to go from here. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to jump into a a crazy thing we've been talking about. You mentioned blue eyed soul in the last episode. And of course it was in reaction to a comment about Daryl Hall, uh, which of course, you know, that like he definitely fits that, that realm, but after the show and then, uh, you know, there was an article actually that I posted to our gig gab Facebook page uh, about Alex Chilton. And I, you know, I think not enough people know about Alex Chilton. He, uh, he started life as, well, I mean, he started life as a young boy, but, uh, but as a young boy at the age of 16, he recorded, I don't know if it went number one, but he joined a band called the box tops and recorded a tune called the letter, uh, which most of us know as, uh, by, from Joe Cocker's version. Right. But you know, Joe Cocker, uh, was the best paid cover singer in the in the land, right? And and so it was this box tops tune that that he had covered. And Alex Chilton at sixteen recorded this tune, and I mean, like it, the the depth and resonance to his voice and everything, like he just doesn't sound sixty. You got to go find this the the box tops doing the letter and uh, and hear that. And then you know Alex Chilton, uh, of course, had had a. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's a chorus. He did have a, a decent solo career. He was always sort of the not rock star, but he played in a band called Big Star uh, that we've mentioned a few times on the show here. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and that's a band that if you haven't checked them out, oh my gosh, like you have to go and check out Big Star. Every, I, I feel like every musician, certainly contemporary musician, needs to at least know about Big Star, and it's a crime that that so many people do not. Uh, it's, it's not your fault. Uh, of course, it's just the way the music industry sort of did strange things. And, and it's such that that band never gained popularity, but if it weren't for them, you wouldn't have bands like REM and, uh, the replacements and the DBs. And, you know, I could just keep listing bands that wouldn't exist without, um, without the influence of, of big star and especially, especially Alex Chilton. So if I recall, it was Alex passed away, right. As you were getting to um, South by one year and it, and it really kind of covered the industry there. So there was this general industry wide understanding and knowledge of him. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's true. Actually he um, yeah, he died on March 17th of 2010, which was, if I'm not mistaken, a Wednesday that year. And I remember it because Wednesday is really the day that the, um, that the music festival begins at South by Southwest of whatever week it's happening, you know, and it's usually that middle week of March and just ironically, but also just the way, you know, the universe works. 
Big Star was supposed to play a showcase at oh, Antone's yeah. that Saturday night, the, the final night of South by Southwest. And Antone's in Austin, it's a well-known club. It's not huge. It probably holds six to 800 people, maybe. Um, I've played there. It's not like, it, 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 you know, it's a great club, but it's not one of these. It's it's not the big, you know, 2000 seater stage or, or, or larger, right, that they, they have at places. But it was supposed to be a thing. And uh, and then, yeah, Alex passed away. And yes, like uh, to your point, the whole conference just became about them on Friday night. Cheap Trick played at uh, at the at one of the much larger outdoor stages at Auditorium Shores. And uh, in the middle of their set, uh, Rick Nielsen came up and uh, and said, actually, earlier that day, I saw him interviewed and, and he said hello to you. But I think I passed that along years, years ago. So mm-hmm. if I if I didn't, Rick said hello. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but that night on stage, he he said, yeah, you know, somebody passed away this week. And uh, he mentioned Alex Chilton. He said, you know, the guy was really influential to us. And he said, you know, we, we covered one of their tunes and we're going to do it now. And and they played a, a cover of Big Stars in the Street, which most people know as the theme for that '70s show when Cheap Trick oh, yeah, did that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so again, and, you know, and it was it was just this thing, and they were going to cancel the Saturday Night Big Star show because, of course, no Alex Chilton. But um, but instead, they kept the show, and it was. Um, it was really interesting. The big star had sort of uh, reformed with Alex Chilton fronting the band, Jody Stevens playing uh, drums who had, he, and he was the original drummer in the band. I think he might've predated Alex Chilton in the band. I think he was in the band with Chris Bell before Alex joined. And then um, it was John Auer and Ken, Ken Stringfellow. The Posies were sort of the other members of big star and the Posies for the record or another band that wouldn't really have existed the way they did without big star. So sort of a dream come true for these guys to play with, with big star for as long as they did. And, and so the three of them backed up this all-star lineup of people that, that didn't really, I mean, it, it felt like an all-star lineup, but, but it, it was more a, a wake, a, you know, a musical celebration, I guess is really the, the, the way to say it about Alex's life. And, you know, Mike mm-hmm. Mills from REM was there. M Ward was there. Uh, Chris Stamey from the DBs sang a tune. Uh, Sandra Lurcher sang a tune. It was just, I mean, it was just one after another and everybody just came out and did their thing. It, 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 when I say it wasn't an all-star lineup, I mean, it was on paper, but no one was there to be themselves, right? Like, no, no, Mike Mills wasn't there to say, hey, look, I'm Mike Mills. It was, hey, look, I'm here because, you know, this guy influenced me and I want to do a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how everybody was, you know, it was such a cool thing. Really. Um, And did you ever see Big Star perform? I never did. That was as close as I ever got. Um, Mm. I never, I knew of Big Star, you know, I played in bands uh, when I was a kid that, um, that, you know, cry like a baby and, you know, the letter and that type of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I played those tunes. I actually played free again with um, my friend, Mark Lintzemeyer, who we had on the show and who wrote our yeah. theme song. Yep. Uh, free again was an Alex Chilton solo tune. Uh, and then, you know, I knew of REM's version of like Femme Fatale, which was on Big Star's third album. Uh, of course, I knew the replacement song, Alex Chilton. Uh where he says, I'll never travel far without a little big star. But when I first heard that tune, I had no idea who big star was. It was years later that it was like, Oh, I get that. Now I understand the lyrics. Okay, cool. Um, and I, I am not ashamed to say that there were many big star tunes. I did not know until that night that I, you know, mm-hmm. saw him play and was just blown away. Yeah. And, and then, you know, they did a movie about Alex Chilton or, uh, maybe it was big star in general, but worth watching talked about really why they weren't stars in the music industry. It's a really fascinating uh, little, it's just how things work, you know, but um, yeah. The name of that movie. That'd be cool to see. Uh, yeah. I'll put it in the, in the, uh, in the thing, in the show notes we call them. But anyway, I, in, and so I, after thinking about all that, I actually put together a playlist for my daughter and, and now she's getting into big star. So, you know, it's, it's mm. all good. Yeah. 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 So. You need to know where we come from. We need to know where we come from. Yeah, it's good. And plus, it's just such good music. Like power pop in general, mm. in my opinion, started right there. You know, so there you go. Yeah, I love it. 
Yeah. So I had four gigs uh, uh, this past weekend and oh. um, yeah, it's, it was busy and it was kind of funny because we've, I haven't had much since the first of the year, a couple, right? Since January 1st. And uh, this was on the calendar and it just worked out that they were, you know, it was, it was a, a Valentine's ticketed event we did, went good, you know, really good. And then a club date, then a club date. And then we did on Sunday, last night, we did this um, tribute to a, a local musician, very, very well loved musician from a very, very well loved local band uh, who passed from cancer and, and uh, his friends in that band organized a, a fundraiser to help the family with the medical costs. And, you know, I was thinking of a lot of things for the show being there. One is, again, we talk all the times about scenes and, you know, the value of a, of a musical scene. And I'm sitting there, you know, this starts with two guys who had been friends for over 40 years that played music through their lifetime together. Right. Yep. Um, and, uh, and they got into a band together that became a very popular working band, supported families, you know, in, in the years where, you know, you could play quite a few casuals and corporate dates and, and be a working musician and support a family. It was a viable option through those years, seventies, eighties, you know, maybe even to the early nineties. Sure. Um, uh, and then, you know, these are, these are, um, luminaries in my area's music community. They're very giving. They're very encouraging. That's part of a scene too. You know, who are the senior statesmen? And then, uh, you know, you get an event like this and, you know, every musician in the world came, you know, there was music from two in the morning till 10 at night. Um, house rockers played the closing slot from nine to 10. We were really honored to be offered, you know, that slot. Um, and then the garage band, Jack's band played immediately preceding us. And, uh, it was just an amazing, you know, emotional, beautiful thing. And because of the stature that these guys have, they have some pretty cool friends. So in addition to their band, which is super, um, um, there was a uh, sax player, from the Doobie Brothers, there was a sax player from Tower of Power, a uh, sax player from Sons of Champlin, um, just and really fantastic players. And again, my you know my mind is always kind of, what can I share to learn from this? And so yeah. you know among many things, a scenes are valuable, especially as live music in many places is on live support scenes that generate enthusiasm and encouragement and gigs are good things. You know, they are, uh, you know, people want to be attached to something vibrant. So if your music scene is vibrant, it can, it can address maybe some of the, the dearth of, of uh, momentum a, in, in many markets. That's a really good point. Everybody wants to back a winning horse, right? And, exactly. and so if you know that there's this gestalt of your local music scene being a thriving thing, you might be more likely to say, oh, should we go to the movies or should we go out and see a band? Oh, let's That's go right. see a band. Right. Like that. You, you like just knowing that the music scene is good. Doesn't matter if it would be, have been the same band, even if the, the, the mindset was, ah, oh, the music scene sucks. Same band playing the same songs, doing the same thing. More people will go. If the mindset is the music scene is good. So, yeah. Well, and this takes on many arms and legs. I mean, I think, you know, music scene being good is not just people with chops. Right. But it's people who entertain, who make the act of going out and experiencing live music better. And, and you know, that can be a whole bunch of different things. It could be someone who's charming. It could be someone who's funny. It could be someone who is self-effacing. I mean, whatever that thing is, that makes going seeing them feel like a connected experience or going and seeing that band feel like a connected experience. Yeah. And I think that might be one of the things that, that works against so many music markets. You know, there are a lot of cover bands in a lot of markets. Sure. There's a lot of overlapping songs in a lot of cover bands in a lot of markets. There's a lot of, um, weekend warriors who are just happy for the gig in a lot of band cover bands and a lot of markets. Right. And, and so what is different anymore? Right. You know, how many times can you hear that guns and roses song? Right. And, yeah. you know, I get it. It's a great song and people enjoy it, but I mean, you know, yeah, you don't have to different? leave the what couch to vibrant? hear it. Right. Yeah. That's exactly right. I mean, the first time it was out, you know, the, Oh, that's the guitar player that can do that. And they sounded just like the band. That was a cool thing. But you know, we're so many years into the cover band experience. I, Actually, my mind has moved quite a way since I started the House Rockers. When I, when I started, I say, you know, listen, we're going to we're going to play the true to the original. And, um, you know, if you can't improve upon it, <laughs> don't, don't mess it up. And play. Yeah, right. But now I'm actually my mind is a little bit more like what's actually interesting to me is uh, creative, vibrant takes on cover music. You've, we've all heard the covered songs, especially since so much of it is 30, 40, 50 year old music. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know so much, you know, I, there are a lot of bands that have 
absolutely awesome harmony and, you know, do Beatles covers. They're sure. not quite as good as the Beatles, but there's a lot of bands who, you know, do Beatles covers. I actually love it when someone takes these songs that are good enough to actually hold this up to the light and, and find something interesting to do. Our band has kind of intuitively done that just because we had horns to a lot of stuff where horns didn't exist before. And that's just different in general. And the point here is different. I mean, the point here is what, as a cover band, what are you adding, adding to the equation, right? Yeah. What, it, what is making it interesting? So vibrant scenes, um, you know, like, like the garage band, they, they were st- stellar musicians. And when they opened up, their vibe was about getting a kick out of each other, opening a song up. And anybody could do that actually, you know, but if you just do it and turn them into, you know, shoegazing jam band, that's going to be hard to sell in many places these days in a cover situation. Again, if it's original music, I think it's a little bit of a different situation that people are, you know, are, are reaching for the gist of the, of the vibe of an original tune. But, you know, all along the watchtower has been played 70 zillion times, right? Yeah. If you're going to do something different to it, is it even entertaining to you that the, you know, that the guys in the band are like paying Fair. attention to it? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So that's one thing is like, you know, vibrancy and, and healthy scenes, I think are, are really valuable. And, it, you know, whether you're the type of guy who can lead and get your community together, I, I host that cocktail party at, um, at Christmas, you know, there've been a couple of tribute events where many bands have participated and those bands talk to each other and they refer They refer gigs when they can't take a gig to each other and they, you know, constantly are just kind of checking in. That's, I think, what a good leader does is, is, you know, kind of keeps the pulse, stimulates where they can stimulate. Right. You know, again, we're taking the path here. The bar scene, there's a couple Um, out here there. The winery scene is getting is getting more vibrant. There's certainly a lot of wineries. And then I've been a big you know, champion about doing something special, doing, doing a ticketed music thing. And I'm finding that people are willing to pay for a good night of entertainment still. Yeah. But maybe the same cover set or, or largely the same cover set or perceived to be the same cover it doesn't, set. Right. Perceived to be is the key. It right? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Even if you've got, Oh, but they haven't heard these three, three songs from us. And that's the showcase of our set might not be enough. It's up to you to figure out if it is or not, but it might not be enough. But you know, I, I, I bring this up. Many times over our four years together, Dave, but vibrancy is valuable. Like you said, everybody wants to back a winning horse. They want to connect. They want to touch. They want to be a. They want to be where the action is. If you can be that type of guy, you probably have a a heads up on competition. B, you're probably doing your local music community a service. If you can, if you can create where the action is around what you do, I think that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's great. So the other yeah. the other thing I want to share is is um, like I said, the last one we had um, Tom Pulitzer from Tower of Power, and um, and a few other celebrities uh, that kind of sat in on some stuff, and, and it was kind of fun because the last song that the Garage Band played at this at this benefit uh, was "What Is Hip." Mm-hmm. And it was my five horns along with their four horns. Wow! And, uh, <laughs> and you know, and it was just really wonderful. The thing that I noticed, like I kind of walked into an area where uh, these guys were warming up, you know, there's there still is a don't fool yourself. There's a dramatic difference between the best of the best, you know, the, the true professionals, the, the the grizzled, you know, veterans, you know, the presence to their playing is unmistakable. Oh, yeah. There, there's not flukes, you know, when you get to be that level of success. And it's a good reminder as a semi-professional musician that, you know, as, as good as you may think you are, there's a magic to the level that takes you to that it, level. It, we it, talked about this when I went and, or the after I went and saw Carl Allen and the art of Elvin, that that jazz thing right. that I saw, you know, whatever, right. a few months ago. It, it's, it's exactly this. Like, yeah, you could play these tunes, but holy like these guys that have truly dedicated their lives to this as the priority and also came in with possibly more talent than any of us would ever have had anyway. Like it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And some of it, we talked about this as well. Some of it you're born with. Yep. There is a, a degree to which you can develop it. Absolutely. I personally think in life in general, it's more about what you're born with. Right. I, I just think in all aspects of life, there's certainly hard work will take many people who might not get that far farther, but you know, those people who are truly blessed, there's something about the laws of the universe that get them often, I guess, you huh. know, 
interesting, you know, given our, our context about Alex Chilton here. Right. Yeah. But, um, you know, so that, that's one side of it, but, um, I, I might, just I might that, disagree with you there, or I might, I might open the, the, the list of things like, is it just that that person, you know, take a horn player, right? Is it just that that person was built to play the horn? Like, is, is that what we're saying is nature versus, versus nurture? Are we saying that that person, maybe they had the same uh, physical, uh, potential physical abilities as you or me with a horn, but they were born with a drive that, that forced them to, you know, that, that made them get better, you know, that, that you or I didn't have, like, I, 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 you know what I mean? I don't know. I don't, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know that I agree that people are just born with the ability to, you know, just go and do things. I, I mean, no, so what I'm saying is some people are, yeah. What I'm saying is some people are born with remarkable ability. If they are also born with drive, that's pretty powerful and unstoppable. Yeah, I think you know, exactly. there's a lot of people who waste yeah. their talent for sure. Correct. But, you know, and the way it manifests itself, the way that I experience it in the, in the brushes that I've had is, you know, there is just a aura and an energy to people who are the best of the best. Maybe you yeah. get that from the exposure you have of having, you know, being fed encouragement because you're on the right track as you develop as a musician. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. There's you that know, confidence. Saying, sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you brought up Rick Nielsen. Rick was a really interesting one. So through doing the macro expo events, I got a chance to meet and hire, you know, several pretty cool people to perform at the, at the trade show and cheap trick was one of them and cheap trick. Uh, Rick was a remarkable experience for me because you know, he played on Double Fantasy, right? So, you know, John Lennon tapped right. him to come and play, right? And and so, you know, I, and I think Rick, uh, Rick is the original kid of rock and roll. It meant everything to him and it still means everything to him. And, and um, you know, he sold brokered guitars, you know, to, to, to make money at, at one point in his life. And he still is like wide eyed about, about great rock and roll. Last time I spent with him, I mean, it was just really inspiring that he, there was a, a basic truth, a purity in that he has this incredibly original, unique guitar style. Yes. You know, it's it's um, it's rhythmic, you know, with all of a sudden some really, really interesting lick, you know, bridging things in, you know, truly, a, you know, a power pop, you know, when he's yeah. you know, the only guitarist in the band um, and that he's developed it and it's unique and original. But he had that vibrancy magnetism. I mean, you know, uh, he, he does. He has, he has that charm. Um, but he, but it's, but at the same time, he is so driven. Like he Absolutely. is a force of nature and, 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 and he's so willing to be, um, I, I'm going to say the word opportunistic and I don't mean it in a negative way. Like, you know, he, I mean, look, Robin Zander has an amazing voice and he's like, okay, perfect. Like that's the guy that does this. And it's just, you know, he found all the right pieces. He put this thing together and Oh, Holy crap. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like he's just, he's self-aware enough to know that, okay, in order to succeed, I need all of these things and I got to find them. You, you know, it's just, it, and then he's driven to do it and has that charisma. And he also and, had the most, Remarkable and way of writing ability. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And he had a remarkable way of. Uh, grokking that there's a music business and to be successful, in it, you have to be aggressive and you have to be driven and you have to go yes. and take you know, advantage of all these things. But that didn't take away from a, his purity of loving rock and roll and, you know, B at least my time with him, I never got a shred. And, and I think you've seen this in some people, some musicians are bitter that the music industry is so hard. You know, yeah. some of you have a no. palpable, you know, sourness to them that, you know, for all that they put in the music the business is hard. I never got that from Rick. It was more oh, a matter knew, of fact. He knew it was, right? it was just a matter of fact. He knew it was going to be hard. It was part of the deal. It's, it was part of the deal. He said it was him and Robin Zander that were interviewed at South by Southwest that, that year that I, that I, and it was after their interview. I went up and talked to him and told him you said hi and all that stuff. Uh, and during the interview, I remember him saying, he's like, oh, you know, no, we've had the best career. He says, because we're not anybody's favorite band. Now, of course, this generalization, there's somebody <laughs> who's cheap trick is their favorite band. But he's like, we're not everybody's favorite band. He's like, but all you got to do is go back four or five records in the box in, in, you know, in their in their first box of albums. And there we are. He's like, that is a fantastic place to be because there's no pressure on us 
to do the thing that made us your favorite band. We just keep Absolutely. doing what we do and we'll be number four or five. He says, but we're number four or five for everybody. And he says, let yeah. me tell you, that's a lucrative place to be. <laughs> it's true, right? You know, Rock and roll Hall of Famers, man. I know. I know. It's great. Yeah, I, I really enjoy it. And, and, you know, another thing about Rick. So those songs are actually a little harder to cop cover band wise there's totally you know, there's there's little things about them that make them hard to do well, what they it's do. that power pop thing where the nuances matter because without them the songs are nothing i mean they're not nothing yeah. but it's it, the songs aren't the songs yeah but again they're they're a type of band like many of the musical things that i are am inspired with where it's guys who just kind of grip and rip it you know they just grab yeah. their instruments and play and it, it you know it makes you feel that i can get into the into the arena of, of doing that type of thing and making people feel that type of thing. Yep. Again, details, you know, are important and, and uh, oh, they're yeah. definitely there in cheap trick, you know, dream police. That's not a standard cover band too, right? No, nope. even surrender has some unique parts to it, right? It has to be straight on tight. You can't make it messy. No, nope. and you have to go through, you have to go through right. that, uh, that key change. Right. So you do, I, I mean, yeah, well, and, and then you have a tune like California man, which like goes in a completely different direction. And then there's the flame, which most people don't even remember. Remember is a cheap trick tune, but everybody knows it. Everybody right? danced to it in high school. You got it. <laughs> you definitely. <laughs> we were walking out of a club and my wife is arguably more a student of rock and roll than me. And, and trust me when I, when I say that saying something and we're walking out of a, a, a restaurant or something in Burlington when we were there a couple of weeks ago and the flame was playing. I'm like, ah, oh, there's cheap trick. Man, those guys are everywhere. And she's like, this was cheap trick. I'm like, Yeah. She's like, oh, <laughs> holy crap, you're right. Like, I know, it's crazy. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Great, yeah. Great, tune. great guys, too. Great, yep. So, yep. So, very, very interesting. And, and, you know, four unique things, kind of Beatles like, right? You know, yeah. four very unique cats. Don't know what they have, what they have done as well without each other. You know, don't know that. Right. But, but uh, together, it's pretty magical stuff. I mean, it is, yeah. it is definitive power pop. It, it, it is and, and transcends it, too, because there's people that, again, to their, you know, we're fourth or fifth in everybody's hearts. Uh, it, 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 there's people that would tell you they are not fans of power pop that are, you know, classic rock purists. And yet Cheap Trick definitely deserves, you know, the number five spot in their record bin. So <laughs> uh, it's it, it's really fascinating that, you know, they did that. The police did that, too, in a different way. But it's a perhaps a different conversation. So. Well, and you, you kind of wonder what, what's the difference? I mean, they went uh, Cheap Trick, the vibe that they created, you know, Rick being the kind of silly guy in, in the suit, um, you know, <laughs> the 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 disinterested drummer, the the great the great front man, you know, they, they, they cast a vibe. Their songs are every bit as good and powerful as so many other bands that were, you know, number, might've been number two, three or four in their list. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I would gather that there's a little bit of vibe and a little bit of MTV is how you discovered him. It's like, you know, with Bruce, so many people have a perception of Bruce that is all from 1984 when born in the USA came sure. out and the, you know, the bandanas and all that type of stuff. And that's their whole thing. I, I just played that Bruce gig with a bunch of guys from, from Schenectady and, and, uh, and uh, Rochester, New York, who grew up in the basic area. And they, they, they kind of dismissed it and they had no idea the songs were as complex or as interesting or as fun to play or as, or as you know, melodically or lyrically interesting. That image thing, probably back to Chilton, right? That yeah. image thing is part of the whole deal. Yeah. For, yeah. You know, in, in that arena. It's true. Yeah, no, it definitely is. It definitely is. Yeah, you got to you got to have it. Yep. It's crazy. It's good stuff, man. For sure. For sure. Well, do we uh do we take a listener question? Sure. Okay, it. cool. Um we have one that's been sitting around for a little while and I'll I'll qualify it that far and no further from Kevin who says uh we recently lost a band member over how we handle compensation. This is what we do. I haul the trailer with all the gear. In addition, since I have a van, all members have the option to ride to gigs with me when it's convenient. Since I burn up a bunch of gas hauling all the gear and people, uh, we came up with an agreement that everyone pays five bucks a gig to me for gas. Additionally, some of the PA gear has taken a beating from just normal wear and tear. We've also agreed that each member contributes five bucks a gig towards an equipment fund. This has allowed us to replace some blown speakers, upgrade lighting and replace mic stands and other things. So basically what this means is that before anyone gets paid for the gig, 45 bucks comes off the top for expenses. Before we bring any member on board, we communicate this to them. The member who, was, who left was aware of the policy before he joined. 
Do you believe that this is a fair arrangement? So he has some questions. He says, uh, how do you guys handle payouts? I'm not looking for you guys to tell me what you make per gig. That's none of my business, but I would love to hear you discuss the issues of paying members. If you provide any bonuses like a booking bonus and how you replace uh, or repair broken gear that aren't your personal instruments. So we've, we've had this conversation a few times over the years in a few different ways. Um, and I, I'll, I know I know you have your thing. I I have mine. I'll I'll start. Um, it, this is, I think this is a fair arrangement. Anytime I join a band as a side person, the first thing I say to the band leader or whoever it is that's bringing me in, hey, look, uh, I I believe that whoever's booking the gigs uh, should get a ten percent off the top. Like th- I tell everybody this as soon as I join the band because I've seen bands fall apart in exactly the way Kevin mentions here. And some people will say, oh, yeah, we already do that. And it's like, okay, cool. Uh, And some will say, no, no, you know, like, it's fine. I'm okay. And when they say it's fine, I I first say thank you. And then I say, but no, that the day that you decide you need to take 10% off the top, just do it. Tell me that you've done it, but you do not need to to get my permission or my buy-in because you already have it. And it will not change. Like, there's just no way that that's going to change. Because I appreciate when somebody's going and getting the gigs and doing like that's a lot of legwork. I've done it, and I don't, frankly, don't really want to do it. I I don't have time in my life to do it. I just want to go play the gigs. So you you take ten percent. It's on. It's all yours. The 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 concept of of renting a PA that it depends. In your scenario, I think it's absolutely it, it makes perfect sense, Kevin, because you are a band member that also brings the PA. When the the conversation we've had previously was when we, uh, you know, when there's a separate sound person that is paid separately and they bring the PA and then they also get a PA rental fee. To me, that seems like, well, you're being paid as a member of the band. Band members aren't bringing their own, you know, being paid to bring their guitars. You're bringing that because that's your instrument. Like that, th- th- that's a different conversation. But it, when it's, you know, a four piece band and one of the guys in the band has a PA. Absolutely. By all means, you know, that needs to be compensated and, and or it, it at least should be able to be compensated if, again sure. if that person doesn't want that then fine but you know it sh- that should be eyes wide open for everybody i i so i think what you're doing is totally fair in fact i'm not sure you're getting enough uh but maybe based on what you're getting per gig in your market you know taking more than 45 bucks off the top of every gig is is too much of a stretch so mm. you, you just you leave it at that but I, I think it's i think it's all good i and i think it's smart to do it up front so that because bands fall apart over money, man, it's well, you know. absolutely. So the, the two things that uh, are the most common things that make band fall apart are money and creative differences. Right. Right. That's it. Uh, yeah. You know, the thing that they share in common is that you can actually. Whatever the, the decision making mechanisms of your band are, whether it's there's a leader and an owner or whether it's a true democracy, you know, you, the, you know, a band needs to have that conversation of of agreeing to what that process is and new people need to see it. That's it. Yep. And, you know, I actually wonder. My band has never signed anything. I, have you ever been asked to sign anything as part of a band that says you understand how things are going to work? Huh? No, I haven't. But I have had conversations like when I joined Uptown Celebration I I was told how it worked Um, and it wasn't really a negotiation to be fair it was you know uh, this is how it is and and the deal here's the deal but I mean it was a negotiation in so much as it was all laid out and it was do you want the gig (laughs) you know so so yes I had the opportunity to to not to to express displeasure and and withdraw from it it wasn't forced upon me uh, I chose to take it. And and our deal in Uptown is that our sound guy gets paid and we pay an equipment fee. Uh, I, you know, it's I, like it was not my place to to I like I accept it there because I was told like it it's not I don't necessarily agree with it fundamentally, but I do. The, I take the gigs like it's, it's yeah. I don't I don't argue about it at the gigs because I knew it going in. It's fine. If it were ever to be brought up for discussion. I would happily, you know, uh, argue my case, but, uh, but up until that point, no, it, because it's, yeah. it's just how the band works. Yeah. So clarity is important, but I, my experience is not only from the people I have had musical interactions with, but with many band leaders I talk to is that 
clarity often <laughs> gets muddied if someone wants to see an angle to it that will serve a, an argument I, or a purpose, right? You know, so, I say this, about, yeah, I say this about Uptown Celebration now, if I'm still in this band 10 years from now, do I find, you know, does, does the, the core of me that needs to seek justice find some way to surface this, not as a complaint, but as a complaint, you know, in some way and foment dissension? I'm not going to say it won't happen. Right. Like, cause I know how I am. So <laughs> I'm just self-awareness here. But so yes, clarity is important, but I'm with you. There's an aspect. Clarity. There. And this is yeah. why I'm actually now, I, I wonder if written things are more valuable and, and it's um, money is a, is a weird thing, especially if there's a, any reasonable amount of money on the table. Again, if it's once a month and you know, and there's a verbal conversation, maybe, maybe that can be an acceptable thing. Sure. But it's an interesting conversation. I mean, is is the task of booking worth more than the task of, you know, who does the website? Is the task of uh, uh, of one service to the band? You know, there's the greater yeah. good concept and the, yeah. and the, you know, what needs to be done to make a band successful. And then there's the, you know, the practicalities. You know, I, like you, and certainly as the guy who does it and has done it for a long time, I think that the booking is a particularly unique problem, especially if only one guy in the band does it. If everybody's doing it and there's shared work, then I think it's a different conversation. Totally. But, but no booking, no gigs, right? Oh yeah. You're, band, you're the, the you're the salesperson, that, right? Yeah, like in, if the in, band in, agrees, we're going to stay home and we'll work when the, when the phone rings, um, you're probably going to lose your band because guys will go find something else to do with something else that's working a little bit more. So somebody that does it, 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 in, in like, I, I mean, not that a band is in business, but in business, it, it, it like, if you get a bunch of CEOs together, the one thing that they'll all tell you is perhaps at that moment, but certainly at some point during their careers, their salespeople all made more than they did. Why? Because that's really important to your business. Like, that's right. You know, it's just not uncommon for your salespeople to make more than you do, uh, you know, and, in, in business. And and that's a good thing, right? Because that means that, that you means have business. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So I, I tend to think that even in the realm of running a band, booking is a particularly you know, like everything's important. You got to have a good product. You have yeah. to have good musicians. You got to have good singers. You got to have good lights. You got to have good, good sound. It's all important. Yep. But I tend to think that booking like you is a, it is, it feeds the lifeblood of the band, which is working. It's and so sales. That, that's one. You got to have it. You got to have yeah. it. Now, if you can build a funnel where, you know, you don't have to do any outreach to have your sales happen. Sales are still happening, right? But what that funnel, whatever it is, if it's a person beating the pavement, if it's some magical thing that you can sort out a search engine term to, you know, get club owners to click and book your band, man, come on the show and tell us. We tell will, us how to do it. Like, and then yeah. the other thing I know and you know, lots of very talented guys and very good bands that never work because nobody course. sells it. They sit at home on a Friday night or a Saturday night because nobody wants to put themselves out and there and be that guy. This so is why awesome. I tell every band leader or whatever you want to call the, the that person in that role. When I join the band, you should take 10 percent, uh, you know, like because I know the value of that. I like, so that's that. That's that. The, yeah. The sound system thing is really interesting to me. So. You know, that's a very real cost. I own about 20 grand worth of sound gear. Mm -hmm. Right. I bought it. Um, and I've put probably over the years, four to five grand in maintaining it, replacing, sure. upgrading, of fixing, right? Yep. That's a real dollar amount over time, but I own it. And so what is the right way? You know, it's not that I want to profit off of it, especially with my own band. Um, but there's a real dollar amount to right. it. Right. You and, you and bought it because you were willing to make that investment, knowing you may never get any of that money back. Because you wanted to have this quality sound system because you knew that was, I don't want to say the only way, but certainly the best way that you could come up with, given all whatever circumstances there were, to make your, give your band the best shot of sounding good at the gigs and all that stuff. But you don't just want to, you don't just want it to be a pit that you're pouring money into, especially when everyone around you is making money in the band and you're, you know, taking every bit that you get and not putting it into just your guitar. Do you want to like, that's one thing that's your instrument. That's what you do. But then there's, well, this thing that everybody uses the collective. And so, so I'll give you an example. So sense. our band, you know, especially the conversations we've been having here, more guys want to go in ears. We need more 
yeah. monitor mixes. So the next board, you know, is going to be a two to three grand layout to, you know, to be able to support, you know, eight plus monitor mixes. Right. Yep. And so it's a smart thing to do too. Yep. Fair enough. And so, you know, this is the question, you know, it's, it's not so much that, that the desire to profit off of the system off your own band, but there is real costs. And, you know, I talked to one other band leader and he, he said, yes, we take a little bit off of each thing. And each guy puts in every gig a little bit for a band fund. And when you leave the band, that's the, my question. Yeah. Yeah. When you leave the band, you get, they had some calculation for a fair market value, not new fair market value of a depreciated piece of equipment. And you actually got a, a you know, a little bit of that, you know, whatever it was. And so, and, and, it, and what I, that meant to me is that it's an attempt to be fair. You've paid yes. in, yes. you own, you own it. Now you're leaving. You don't lose that. And I, I think that that's kind of a cool thing. And that's one model. Everybody that's a, pays That's in. a hard thing to do. I, I've always preferred bands where the gear is owned clearly by one person. One guy. Now, yeah. it could be that guy owns three of the monitors. That guy owns the mixer. Like, whatever that is, that's fine. But it's so much simpler if everybody, yeah. if there's no confusion on those points. But- when you got one guy that owns 100% of it and you need to re- like maintain that stuff, well, it gets a little fuzzy. <laughs> and that's why, you know, I've heard the argument about, you know, bands are bands are amalgams of people, you know, putting into the communal greater good. But, you know, there's never, you know, hundreds of hours booking doesn't equate to, you know, I, I love my guys who write horn charts, but, you know, the amount of time is not an equal thing. Um, you know, every task that goes into, you know, the, the doing of the website, you know, but uh, and the, the flip side of that is it is actually fair, you know, and maybe this is the most valuable part of the conversation. You have to hold your band's business model up to up to the light and figure out what's reasonable. You know, yeah. there's one guy charged for if you rehearse it, you're like, you know, you rehearse at your place, right? Yep. You, you built a rehearsal place. I did. Is it? Is a service you charge for your to your band? No. Has it actually has it ever dawned on you that that's a reasonable thing to you because you had some costs in building the thing and you know and and running it and you know electricity and whatever it might well, be and the, and the gear that needs to be here to, to yeah. no this is my rehearsal space um it I don't I don't charge the guys I never thought about that but we do. Like if the guys leave their amps here, which they often do, uh, you know, if I have a rehearsal with somebody else or if my when my daughter was playing in a band when she was in high school here in middle school, you know, they were I I asked them. I didn't just do it without the, you know, their permission. But it was like, hey, your gear's here. You know, can I use can I have so and so use your amp or whatever? And 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 so, no, but like there's a huge convenience to me in being able to literally walk across my driveway and everything's set up. My drums are here. I don't have to schlep anything anywhere, including myself. You know, like it's I would have this space anyway that and and there's like I, and I'm not interested in in arguing that I wouldn't just to, you know, try and get an extra 10 bucks out of somebody. Right. It's it. I have this space. I use it. I mean, it right now. Podcasting. I've I've made the the walls nice and dead with uh, Oral X tiles. You know, it's a great sounding room. And I love rehearsing here because it's a great sounding room. And also right. my house is right there. <laughs> so, so, yeah. You know, my yeah. point is, is that it's it, a good it is, point. You know, I could, ch- I suppose I could charge for rehearsals. I feel like in retrospect, I should have charged the university of New Hampshire for the, <laughs> no, for the rehearsals that I held here for their theater shows. Yeah. Um, especially given, you know, that, that, uh, well, anyway, uh, but yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but, but I the, haven't, the point of all and this I'm okay is with it. Yeah. Once you open that, that the genie's out of the bottle yeah. and talking about what are, what are the co- true costs of running a band, you know, all of a sudden you'll get a lot of perspectives and you'll get, and all of them valid, right? Yes. I mean, there is, a, there is a reasonable distance. And my thought to that is this is where having a leader led band is particularly useful because a leader can say, okay, guys, I get it. The basic commitment of being in the band is you will learn your parts. You will come to one rehearsal a week and you will show up on time and you will play. You know, that's, that's the essence of, of the, of the contract, the social contract of you playing in a band. Anything else is reasonable for us to just say, you know, what, what, you know, what is fair and everybody gets to decide what it is. But I think what's also reasonable is the band leader can say, okay, listen, yep. Those are all costs. And, you know, at some point in time, 
band members need to be paid for planning the thing. So we're going to have to come up with a budget and we'll say, okay, um, you know, we can afford given the amount of work this band does to rehearse X time a year, yep. um, you know, and you know, that's the budget for rehearsal and we can, you know, afford, uh, you know, uh, you know, five horn charts. So we'll do five new songs a year. We can afford, um, you know, uh, we can't buy a new piece of gear this year. You know, if, if, uh, if, uh, the charge, the band is X per, per band member per gig that goes into a fund, we can't buy that, you know, that, um, that mixer this year or, or, you know, the leader won't buy the mixer this year or whatever, yeah. you know, whatever that is, but it basically it is. You're, yeah. you're, 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 you're coming up with a budget. You're coming up with a PL that really kind of details all this stuff out. Yeah. The hard thing is that socialist part, you know, where it's group ownership of stuff because people do leave. And that implies that you have to set a little bit aside to compensate them if they leave in order to be fair. I can't think of another way to do it. Like you said, like you can tell people you're paying into this and that's part of you know being in the band is that that's sunk money, man. It's just less coming out of your pay. It goes into the band. The band will continue. Yeah, but what happens? You. The problem with that is what happens not just when one person leaves, but when the band falls apart like yeah. who's who does the gear go to and that's why i like the okay look we need a new monitor you know that speaker's shot uh, what do you do if what, you do know, if, what do you do if the guy who owns the monitors leaves the band and the new guy doesn't have any monitors right well you know that's why david lee roth got the gig he had because he had a pa right so <laughs> i like i mean no his like the, i wonder this if he is, charged for it he did he was renting it to them and uh, and finally, they realized if they asked him to sing with them, they didn't have to pay him for the rental. And that's how he got in uh, in with the Van Halen boys. So, that's great. Yep. But but I mean, that's the reality of it is, you know, when you join a band, you bring a lot to the table and it's not. And don't kid yourself that it's just your ability to play your acts, right? Whatever your acts is, it's, you know, your personality it's your transportation. Like how reliable is your, is, is your yeah. car? No, seriously. Like I've been, I've auditioned guys and you know, you walk them out or whatever and you see that they drive this jalopy or whatever. And it's like, Ooh, yeah, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know that that's going to make it to all our gigs. And we, you know, I remember, I won't name a band, but, uh, but there was a band where we held some auditions for someone. And, uh, and I remember sitting there with with one of the other band members, you know, pre existing band members after this guy left, and I was like, "Well, he's a good player, but uh, I don't I don't see that car making it to gigs. Like he does he doesn't have the the financial stability to be reliable enough to us to play in this band. But you know, candidate B is a fine player and is going to be there at every gig. Like we can like let's do that. I've definitely had those conversations yeah. where the, the purist wants the best musician. The practical yeah. person wants the most consistent experience. And so the person with a good mixer and some monitor speak, I guarantee you there's some gigs I've gotten because I was willing to bring like, you know, some sound gear or sound expertise that, you know, was just like, it's fine. And the first yeah. time I realized it, it was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm not here just because I'm a drummer. Like, I wonder if I'm good enough as a drummer to have gotten this gig. Like, you know, you start asking yourself those questions like, well, it doesn't matter. I'm here. You know, yeah. like I, I beat that guy out. Screw him. You know, that's so, funny. yeah, but that's like, that's the reality, you know? So I think net net of this is the, the social contract you have with your band needs to be clear, clearly defined. It needs to be yeah. clearly defined. It needs to be presented it also needs to be, and this is actually the hardest thing, because what happens with, with all these things is so quickly disagreements become personal. Oh, that's it. Yeah. And, and, then, it's a, and then it's a straight slide down. I mean, the, the ability to renegotiate, revisit, discuss um, – Creative approach and financial approach. I mean, you know, I think the two kind of go hand in hand. I mean, you need both to make a band successful. So I think the ability to, and sometimes, you know, it, it does come down to, you know, I get that you, you know, think that this is worth something. I particularly don't think that. So, you know, it's, it might not be the right thing for everybody. So that, that, and again, that can be said in a business like way. It doesn't have to be said, but you know, we're musicians, we're artists and you know, the temptation to, to reach for the emotional, to, to prove a point or to defend a point is, you know, a pretty typical thing. What I would encourage is clarity, specificity, 
revisiting on a constant basis. Are we all cool with this? Do we want to talk about this? And with a reminder that everybody always has options, even as impractical as it may be. Yep. If a guy decides at the end of the day, you know, I've done a little bit more, you know, I redid the website, you know, and I didn't tell you, but I, you know, I went and did it. And, you know, now I want to get paid for that. And someone says, you know, we didn't agree to that in the beginning. And, you know, we have a process in the span that before anybody undergoes any costs, we, you know, we talk about it, whatever that might be. Whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. Whatever it is, you know, but if you can have someone in the band who is the, who is the great business like communicator own that, or if it's a leader band or an owned band, you know, that, that, that person, if you're that person listening to this, the ability to, to, Reemphasize those points in a business-like, non-personal way will help you get over some of the humps. It's not going to solve all problems because, again, you know, artists are you know often emotional, passionate people. It's not going to make something when someone feels wronged by something. Your ability to talk them off the ledge of that is just great leadership skill in any aspect of life. Yeah. But much yeah, more but, difficult I mean, at that point. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But it's I true. think that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I, you know, as we're having this conversation, I realize how um, I, I realize again, it's not the first time I've realized this, uh, but I realize how fortunate we are in fling to have Russ. He is, I mean, he's a fantastic songwriter. He's a great guitar player, um, reliable guy, like really smart, it, it, like so many good things. But in, in this particular realm, he is mostly non-emotional about being able to just objectively look at things and and to the point where you trust him. To, I trust him. And I think everybody, everybody that I know that encounters him trusts him, even when he's tasked with a decision that could benefit him. Like he's generally not greedy about stuff, you know, and so. Um, he does be, I mean, we'll talk about things, but he is our, you know, uh, benevolent dictator when it comes to, all right, you know, a decision needs to be made. He'll be like, okay, here's what it is. This is logical. And it always is something logical. It may not be the logic you wanted, but it, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, it's fine. You know, and everybody agrees. In a democracy, find that guy who has that oh. skill set and put him in the role of, of mitigating this stuff. Good luck. Find, if you find that guy, like saddle up with him and stay with him for your life, because Miriam. that's yeah. a hugely valuable, like ability to have. I don't, I, I can't do that. I'm, I, I get too emotional about stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I can be I mean, logical, but once I'm, once I know my logic, I, I get pretty entrenched, you know? So yeah, and some people are good at arguing and some people are, are, you know, passive, but let the, the, the hurts fester. And yeah, it's all and that's part the of problem, the thing. right? Is you have those people in the band. You've got the people like me that are like, you know, I'm pretty good at arguing, but I'm certainly willing to speak my mind all the time. And then you've got people that are not either of those two things. And having somebody like Russ that sort of sees all of that and says, no, 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 like we, just because that person's quiet, we can't ignore what we know they want. You know, it's like, nope. So here's how it's going to be. It's like, oh, yeah, no, that's that's the glue, man. Right there. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Social engineering. Social engineering. That's what it is. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well. I think we've uh, we've broken the, uh, the we've broken the hour marker here, which Woo! doesn't happen often for us. Hey, so. four years. You got to go for the gusto. Right? Uh, we went for the gusto on this one. I, when we when we entered this question about Kevin 20 minutes ago, uh, I thought, you know, we could just do this like we have enough for an episode. So really, you got a two for today, folks, which is you know, <laughs> that's good. So did we. It's good. Our gift to you. That's right. Happy anniversary to all of us. And uh and yeah, that's, I think that's where we, uh, that's where we'll end it on this one. All right, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for four great years, Dave. Let's do four more. Let's do four more. I will, uh, you know, it, the, the trick to doing this podcast every week is that, uh, we're just always performing. It's what we do. I know I am. Just same. Yeah. You too, folks. Feedback at gigapodcast.com. <laughs>